You can watch Damon and Ratto, obviously, on YouTube or on Twitch. And if you're doing that, you have seen and already you're beholding what is maybe one of the ugliest curtains any hotel has ever had. Nick Ferdell is joining us from a clearly undisclosed location. Nick, thank you for joining us. What in God's name is going on with that hotel room? Are you in an Econo Lodge? Where are you? <laughs> I'm in the, some of the finest digs that San Diego has to offer, Mr. Bruce. It's a, uh, it's a good time out here aside from the back of these curtains, huh? Well, look at it this way. I hope San Diego <laughs> gets a lot prettier beyond those curtains. I know it does. And I know you're hanging out with Slater. You guys are going to go hang out with Juan Soto tonight at a Padres game? That sounds fun. Yep, yep. As soon as, as, soon as we finish up here, Slater and I are going to go check out Petco and... Uh, and see what uh, what's going on there. This is one of my favorite places to be. This is always where I try to escape for a few days during the off season. So it's good to get out here. And of course, I get out to San Diego. I'm thinking I'm going to lay by the pool and and have some pina coladas today. And what happens? Kevin and the Nets come together at least for the time being. I mean ruining your vacation stepping all over it you should be able to bill kevin durant for the rubio's fish tacos you're going to be enjoying at petco tonight you really should um do you yes or no did kevin durant just get reality checked harder than he's ever been reality checked in his entire career to a point but damon i never felt like he really wanted to leave new york uh, i always felt like if they could just calm down the drama a little bit that they could convince him hey let's see how this works moving forward but the hardest part to me as you try to break down what's occurred here isn't so much the nets and and joe size saying hey kevin you're under contract for four more years it was the reality that what the nets were trying to get back for kd in any kind of deal it just wasn't out there so Kevin is well aware of, of the inner workings of the game. I think people don't understand how perceptive he is. And he clearly never made it a point going into the season where he said, I am out of here. And that's the difference to me is he saw that what they were being offered wasn't enough. He thought, okay, well... Let's see how this works, but count me in what feels like a large group of people that cover the league and around the league that are saying, eh, everything's good today at the end of August. Let's see what happens when something else happens, either during training camp or during the season. Rank for me, please, the three things that got most in the way of Kevin Durant finding a new team. Was it the Ben Simmons rookie extension, which prevented a lot of possible trades from happening? Was it concern over the injured Achilles and what his career could look like going forward on a four-year deal? Or was it the haul of the Rudy Gobert deal, which just could not be met? I would rank those. The second one, to me, seemed like the biggest. That at the beginning, when all this popped out, Damon, there were so many people who went, Kevin Durant. This was the NBA's version of Instagram versus reality. The Nets thought, oh, Kevin Durant's on the market. Everybody will give us their very best offer, and we will get an absolute haul to start fresh and move him to a new place. That just never happened. There were a lot of teams that looked around and thought, okay, well, four more years for a guy that has had injury concerns the last couple seasons? Uh, we know he's great when he's on the floor, but can he maintain that going into age 36, 37, 38? The Gobert part of this did not help anybody. Uh, that was a huge issue because from an optics standpoint, there was no way the Nets were going to do some deal and have everybody go, well, they didn't even get what, <laughs> what Minnesota gave up to get Rudy Gobert. Uh, and, and so I think, to me, those two were huge. And then after that, the Simmons part of it didn't help. And guys, in my opinion, we can talk about KD all day. One of the biggest questions for the Nets in the league is, what kind of player is Ben Simmons now? He's been out for a year and a half. What does he become for a team that if they're going to have Kevin Durant and Kyrie 
in theory, will be committed much more this year than he was last year, they can still win. But if Ben Simmons is a shell of what he used to be because of the back issues and because of the mental health concerns, the, the Nets aren't going anywhere. Uh, to the extent that you know him, how does Joe Tsai view his investment now? Is this something where he's still going to be comfortable going in on things, or do you think that he's looked at the way this last year basically imploded upon itself and how the Durant thing only exacerbated it? Is he going to be a sudden hardliner on things? Is he going to start looking maybe to get out? Is there what what's the what's the longer term damage? to his ownership, and to that franchise as a result. It's one of the single biggest questions in the NBA, Ray. Because so many people view Joe Sy and they say, oh, well, he's got a bunch of money. He can just keep throwing it at the Nets and their issues, and he figures that things will take care of themselves. And only he knows that answer. And I can tell you that I have not had a chance to sit down with him uh, yet since I've been there, but the people that are around and that know him inside that organization, they like him. They say he's competitive as hell, just like so many other owners uh, across the league. But what happened in the last six months with this team, they lost not only their identity, but they lost their culture. And Sean Marks said as much at the end of the season. And if you're trying to regain that, and you're trying to uh, bring your power back as both an owner and an investment you made, uh, good luck with the way that you've structured this team. So uh, I think that part is fascinating in this because does there come a point in this year if things don't go as planned where Josiah says, look, I, I can't handle this anymore do whatever we need to do to start fresh and move move forward. And that part, to me, is really intriguing for an owner that thought when you went into business with these stars that wins and championships would come. And what has come is the Nets are a league leader in a category of guys that no team wants to, to be in, and that is drama. And it is a huge component of everything they do internally day-to-day -day right now. When would you expect the fresh spate of Durant trade me rumors to happen? The trade deadline or next offseason? I would think if they struggle to start the year and they're just not the title type of team that everybody thought they were going to be on paper, I would expect it before the trade deadline. Because that's why, and I think this part is crucial to point out, just because that press release came out today, I don't necessarily think, oh, all's well. <laughs> like, I'll just keep rolling and things will be good. I, I don't believe that. That was the most miserable team I've ever seen at the end of last season. They, they just did not enjoy uh, the day-to-day. -day. And I don't just mean players. I mean, everybody will focus on the Kyrie stuff. I mean the coaching staff, the front office, the PR people. Everybody knew how big of a mess that was. And so if they don't turn things around quickly going into next year, I think we're going to hear all the same stuff. And it's not just going to be Kevin, Ray, to your point. It's going to be Kyrie. It's going to be what happens with Simmons. If he's not playing well, I think this could really build up for a while. Nick Ferdell joining us from the Ugly Curtain Motel down in San Diego. Uh, when it comes to the access that you're going to have, you know, you walk in there, you're completely established as a national media presence. Players know who you are without looking at your credential. And Durant, obviously, you and he have a history that brings you both back to Golden State. What kind of access do you think you'll be allowed now? What kind of dour seven, Kevin Durant do you think you'll be dealing with? And then Kyrie and Simmons seems to be a head case among head cases. How... How much harder did your job just get or because covering the circus is always an easy assignment, you actually have an easy assignment after all, even though no one might want to talk to you? Damon, I actually think it's easier, truly, for, for exactly how you just laid it out because the drama, it's always kind of hovering day after day after day. 
And that team last year, uh, no team had more drama at the end of that season because of the Kyrie stuff and Harding getting moved and Simmons is coming back. Oh, no, he's not. <laughs> there, there was always those questions. Uh, as far as the day-to-day, the Nets were one of the worst teams I have ever seen access-wise. There was no human interaction the way there was certainly in the Bay with the Warriors, but with so many other NBA teams. And that was by design. Sean Marks came from the Spurs way. And the Spurs' whole thing and dealing with media has always been less is more. And there were days that you would ask uh, to speak to Kevin or to Harden or to Kyrie, and the Nets would just say, no. (laughs) And it started to change at the very end of the season. But uh, I think the league is going to come down and say, hey, you guys have to follow the rules like everybody else. And if that's the case, that part of this makes it even more interesting for somebody like me who's around these guys day to day. Because, Damon, like you said, I've known Kevin. I I have a relationship with him now. Uh, I wouldn't say I have a very good relationship with Kyrie at the moment, but he knows that I'm going to be there every day, and I'm going to ask him questions that, uh, that he can choose to answer however he wants. And with Simmons, he's the biggest wild card of all because... Kevin and Kyrie, when they're on the floor, for the most part, guys, you know what you're going to get. Are they committed to the team every day? We'll see. But you know what's going to happen. They're outstanding basketball players. Unbelievable. With Simmons, nobody really knows. Nobody knows just how badly he wants to to be at that high, high level again. So he's got to show a lot. But uh, from a media standpoint, uh, now that this news came out today this is the story coming into the league uh, this season because of all the different layers in play and the highs and lows that they'll feel throughout is steve nash in a more secure position now or could it erode if they don't start quickly i think it could erode right it's it's fun to say on paper if you're sean mark uh, steve and i met uh, with Kevin, with, with Josiah and his wife, and everybody's on the same page. And that's cool at the end of August. Well, what happens when you go into a five-game losing streak and all these guys are playing and they're on the floor? So as far as the Nash stuff is concerned, whether he's the right fit or not, uh, what I've been told a couple times within the organization, guys, is Nash, uh, people forget because it, it feels like so long ago, the, that first year, everything was clicking. That offense was, was going the way everybody thought it would. It would. Uh, the players seemed to buy into what he was selling. I remember talking to, to Kevin about it at the end of the season. He couldn't have been uh, more uh, defiant in his pushback that Nash is the guy. He really felt like this was Steve Nash's team. And then we see the reports pop out in the last few weeks, and you're like, huh? That's a change. So uh, as far as Nash goes, like any other coach, he'll be judged on how he, how much he wins or if he doesn't. But, Ray, I, I wouldn't feel more secure today. I think he's got to show up and get everybody on the same page. And with this team and the egos in play, that is a lot easier said than done. Look, we know that you got to go drinking around Petco real soon, and we'll let you go. But uh, an ESPN colleague of yours, Nick, Stephen A. Smith, basically today said that he's worried about Jonathan Kaminga. He's worried about worth, work ethic and the things he's hearing. Have you heard what Stephen A. Smith has to say? Have you heard anything like that about Kaminga? Uh, only, Damon, in, in short doses, and this goes back to uh, more when Kaminga went down to the G League a couple of those times, I, I felt like there were moments when, when people in the organization were kind of like, well, why isn't he just dominating day? And, and sometimes he did. He put up some numbers. And other times, you look at the box score, you're like, huh? <laughs> so I don't know uh, day to day exactly what's going on because I'm not around it as much. But uh, th- there were some questions initially, but th- that was followed up quickly by, hey, we still really, really like him. He's incredibly talented for somebody that's that young, and he's got to learn what's going on in the game. The craziest part about all of this in any Warriors conversation is uh, they barely needed Kaminga last year. We know they didn't need Wiseman to win. At some point, guys, of course they're going to need him. But this team, <laughs> if, if they just stay in place, is going to be uh, playing at a very high level again. And 
uh, as we get out of here, uh, count me in that group that believes that Clay will look a lot better this year moving forward than he did at times last year because all that rust and the angst of coming back after two and a half years that will be gone, and I think that is a big plus for this group moving forward. Go have yourself a fantastic night at the ballpark and see if you can steal a curtain to replace that one behind you at some point. <laughs> and tell Slater we said hi. I will, and I've got to do TV at like 5 in the morning tomorrow, so I will make sure in y'all's honor that I'm not in front of this curtain and that I'm somewhere else uh, on this property. You, like a steamy bathroom would look better on TV than that thing. <laughs> i got to be honest with you. Nick, That's just what the world needs at 5 a.m. I you love in, it. You in a robe, <laughs> sipping coffee with two hands like a commercial. Thank oh, you, Nick. Now there's a viral moment waiting to happen. Thank you very much. Great to talk to you. You got it, guys.